But we start with that huge search, the race to save five people who are on board a submersible that has gone missing in the North Atlantic, close to the wreck of the Titanic. Earlier, the US Coast Guard said that the vessel may only have 40 hours of breathable air left for the five people on board. Well, ships and planes are scouring the ocean around 640 kilometres off the coast of Newfoundland in Canada. The search area is as large as the US state of Connecticut. Officials say an underwater search vessel has now been launched. Well, the Titanic, which sank in 1912, lies nearly 4,000 metres below the surface. On Sunday, all contact with it was lost with the sub uh, about an hour and 45 minutes into its dive. Our correspondent Jessica Parker has this report on the daunting task that is now facing rescuers. These are the last known photos of the Titan submersible. They were taken on Sunday morning, just before it began its descent. An hour and 45 minutes later, contact was lost. It's a five-man capsule that people crawl into. This was filmed by the BBC last year. It shows people being bolted in from the outside. The sub then plunges into the ocean's depths. Those on board are believed to be the British billionaire Hamish Harding, British businessman Shahazada Daoud and his son, French explorer Paul-Henri Najolet, and this man, Stockton Rush, the chief executive of the expedition company Ocean Gate. It's basically a Sony PlayStation style controller. Here he is in a 2022 CBS documentary, showing how the vessel was operated via a games console, while construction pipes were used for ballast. This is an experimental sub. People are informed that it's very dangerous down there. Questions about the safety of the sub are now inevitably being raised, but for now the focus is simply on trying to find the vessel. One Coast Guard official I've been speaking to described the search as like looking for a needle in a haystack. The area that we search is, is roughly about the uh, size of uh, Connecticut. Uh, as we continue on with the search, uh, we're expanding our capabilities to be able to search uh, under the water as well. The sub was towed out to sea from Newfoundland before arriving at the wreck site on Sunday. It then began its dive in coordination with a mother ship, the Polar Prince. Once a vessel goes below a thousand metres, it'll be in darkness, no light. Farther down is the Titanic wreck, 3,800 metres under the North Atlantic. Mike Rees is one of the few people who've made the trip before. He describes reaching the bottom of the ocean. When you touch bottom, you don't really know where you are. And again, the compass immediately stopped working and was just spinning around. And so we had to flail around blindly at the bottom of the ocean, knowing the Titanic was somewhere there. But it is, it is so pitch dark. In the sea's murkiest reaches, this is what people pay nearly £200,000 to see. Ocean Gate Expeditions says it's getting help from government agencies and deep sea companies, and it's praying for the crew's safe return. Jessica Parker, BBC News in Boston. Well, Captain Jamie Frederick from the 1st Coast Guard District has been speaking about the latest search efforts and his team's plans for the next 24 hours. I'll provide a brief recap of our coordinated search efforts for the 21-foot submersible with five people on board along with providing an update on current search efforts and plans for the next 24 hours. On behalf of all the men and women of the United States Coast Guard and our search partners, we offer our most heartfelt thoughts and prayers for the five crew members, their families, and their loved ones. Our crews are working around the clock to ensure that we are doing everything possible to locate the Titan and the five crew members. Yesterday, we stood up a unified command consisting of expertise from the United States Coast Guard, the United States Navy, Canadian Armed Forces and Coast Guard, and the Titan's parent company, Ocean Gate Expedition. This is a complex search effort which requires multiple agencies with subject matter expertise and specialized equipment. While the U.S. Coast Guard has assumed the role of search and rescue mission coordinator, we do not have all of the necessary expertise and equipment retired, required in a search of this nature. 
The Unified Command brings that expertise and additional capability together to maximize effort in solving this very complex problem. So how will it be solved? Let's talk to my colleague, Cole Nassman, who's in Boston for us now. And Cole, we heard there from um, the search and rescue teams, the first part is simply locating this vessel before they can even get into the logistics of how they might be able to recover it and the five people on board. Yeah, I guess the best way to describe this is kind of a two-step process. The first step could be one of the most difficult, and that's simply finding the vessel. Where is it? It could be at the very bottom of the ocean. It could be floating somehow at the top. It might have submerged on its own. The second part will be even more difficult, and that's the very technical and very treacherous and difficult and specialized rescue operation that then might take place because there are very few vessels that are capable of traveling to the depths of the ocean that we're talking about, some two and a half miles below the surface. That is a very long way. The typical submarine that you might think of only goes a few hundred meters deep, and we're talking about thousands of meters deep. I just want to set the scene for you where we are is Boston. We're about 900 miles away from the site of the shipwreck of the Titanic, and that's where we believe that submersible, the Titan, is located. This is what the U.S. Navy is calling its unified command. So they're bringing together communications between uh, the Coast Guard, excuse me, so between the Coast Guard, the U.S. Navy, as well as Canadian officials. You heard them mention there, and this is an important point, that the U.S. Coast Guard simply doesn't have the knowledge or the equipment to carry out this search and rescue mission. And that is why we're seeing such an international effort now bringing in various countries. We have equipment on the way from France. We've heard from Canada and the U.S. as well. In addition, commercial agencies, commercial vessels, they're on the scene as well. And that's because this is such a difficult operation. It's very far away from the coastline, and it's such a deep site as well that this is going to be all hands on deck. And as we heard during the press conference, this really is a full court press. That's how they're describing it. Yeah, and everything you've outlined there, Cole, suggests it takes time. The logistics that need to now uh, fall into place for this search and rescue to really get underway. Um, and yet, at the same time, we are told that there are just 40 hours left of breathable air on this vessel. The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking, and time is really the most precious resource right now. This was a submersible that's not designed to spend days or weeks underneath the surface of the ocean like a submarine would. We believe it has about 96 hours, so four days worth of oxygen on board. Once that runs out, we're not sure what might happen, but there is potentially hope that it could last a bit longer than that. But about four days and, and more than two days have passed, so time is of the essence if they want to be able to reach the vessel in time. And there's one interesting note as well that even if this submersible had come up to the surface and is waiting for a rescue craft to reach it, they're not able to open the submersible from the inside. And hearing some reports from uh, people that have been on this uh, craft before, from a CBS reporter as well, that this is something that can only be opened from the outside. There are 17 bolts, and that is simply because you want to make this as, as watertight as possible, especially at those depths. So whether it's below the ocean, whether it's above the ocean, this vessel needs to be found in order for those uh, five people that are on board to be rescued. For now, Carl, thank you. That's Carl Nassman there, live in Boston for us. Uh, let's speak to David Gallo, who is an American oceanographer and a deep sea explorer. He co-led an exploration of the Titanic in 2010 and co-led the successful international effort to locate the wreck site of Air France Flight 447. Thank you, David, for being with us. Um, you must plan for things like this happening. Uh, I guess you hope, you pray that you will never uh, need to make a rescue of this sort. But what are the preparations for an emergency of this kind? Very interesting that, interesting that you say that, because I think uh, in this, it's a very small community, the deep ocean community. And I think uh, that we've all thought that this is going to happen someday. And for decades, we've gotten away with nothing happening like this. Uh, but we did know it would happen, and uh, it just is a little bit burning that uh, there was no preparation for stuff. No one ever really, there are no policies, no uh, uh, no one on call, no what do we do if. Um, now, there is a, a protocol that you do, of course. You, you would, you, first, you want to be able to use the 
vessels and vehicles and tools that are in the area and hopefully they're suitable and in this case they are. Newfoundland has got many many ships and some of the uh, underwater survey tools that you need. Um, but in terms of the uh, of the uh, actual technique and, and how, how do you use all those, it's really uh, not easy to um, know that until you know a lot about you know, where was the submarine last seen? I think we know that. Uh, what are the environmental conditions? Anyway, there's a number of variables. So uh, it's very difficult to say this is the order that we're going to. Uh, you can have some idea, but specifically it's not easy. And also I think having an armada of uh, vessels on the way is not always the best thing to do. Um, so there's a lot that we could do better in the future, but this whole thing right now is incredibly sad. And one, one more thing, uh, those things you mentioned, the Titanic expedition that I co-led and uh, the Air France, finding the Air France uh, plane, uh, those were all done with PH Nargile, who's uh, sadly on board the expedition and probably uh, in the submarine. And so this is especially bitter for a lot of us. Uh, our prayers and hearts go out to all the families of the victims. And, uh, but in this case, you know, I've got now a double, I've got a, a, a personal stake in this too, and that pH is involved. Yes, um, I wanted to ask that. You've described uh, Paul Henri as one of your closest colleagues, and you've touched there on the on the diving community, a very small community, particularly in that part of the world. Um, many of you know each other. So, um, it is a very worrying time for anyone involved in it. Um, describe to me, if you will, a little bit about the descent, um, because it's very difficult for people who are not familiar with this sort of thing to get their head around quite how deep it is, where the Titanic lies on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, mm -hmm. And we often say, don't we, that we know more about space than we do about the bottom of our own oceans, such as the depth and the complexity of getting down there. Yes, uh, exactly. I mean, uh, we've only explored maybe 10% of the world's oceans, and in that 10%, we find things that we never expected. The world's greatest mountain range, highest mountain peaks, deepest and longest valleys, underwater rivers, underwater waterfalls, underwater lakes. So it's not a big blue fishbowl. And any exp uh, expedition that takes you deep into the ocean, it's almost like going to a totally different planet. Uh, you at the surface, you have that lovely color blue that we're all familiar with uh, of the uh, the shallow ocean, and then you begin the dive. You pass through that blue into medium blue, deep blue, then dark blue, and then for two hours, it's about two and a half hour trip altogether. But about two of those, it's in perfectly pitch black, and. Uh, and uh, up on top, we call it twilight zone, that transition from blue to deep blue. But the rest of it is the midnight zone. And uh, no light has ever been there. Uh, the sun has never been there. And it's very cold, too. So by the time you get to the bottom, you realize you're in a totally different space. And in the earlier comments, you heard that you could be uh, a meter or five meters from the Titanic and never know that it's right there because it's that dark. And uh, sun uh, lights don't penetrate the ocean very far. Uh, you can't uh, use radio waves in the ocean, so GPS is out and radio communications are out. So it's just not what people think. I think a lot of people feel that it's just a dive to a deeper place, but it's, uh, it's not. You're leaving the world that we know, the familiar world behind and entering this very unfamiliar world. Even Titanic that's been visited many, many times, uh, where we find something new almost every expedition to Titanic. It really is fascinating to hear you describe it in those terms, and it really gives you a sense of what those rescue efforts will be up against right now. Um, and David, there are some reports of uh, an emergency ping, an alert that may have come from the vessel. Uh, and I guess at this point, we don't know whether that was generated by those on board or it was done automatically. And, and, and if anything, that just reinforces the idea of quite how remote and quite how isolated those people may feel right now. There is no radio connection. You can't just radio back to the ship above. Uh, talk to me about right. the, the difficulty of communicating with a vessel at such depths. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you can't, there's no radio waves, as I said, so you have to use sound, and you can do that, but um, the bandwidth, if you want to call it that way, you certainly can't have a conversation more than to say, okay, not okay, here we are, that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes you use code, uh, almost like a, a telegraph to send beep, 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 and there's a code that you know what that means, we're okay, that means we're we're uh, in trouble. Um the idea that there's a ping, I, I lived through the Malaysian Air uh, incident that year long trying to find the Malaysian Air. And uh, there's so many rumors about then there. There were pings that we know we've got it. And tomorrow we're going to have it. Boy, we hear the ping. And it was not from the uh, uh, air aircraft at all. So I'm careful to look at those. You can't help but not pay attention to those because it might be true. And I think you have to check that out. But, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if there was a ping where it would have come from if the sub had that ability uh, to send out a ping. Don't know. David, I'm really grateful for you talking to us um, tonight. Uh, I know this is very difficult for all those who knew uh, Paul or know Paul Henri and those on board. Uh, so we really do hope that there is some good news that we can report uh, for everyone involved very soon. Uh, but thank you for being with us. That's David Gallo now.